Why are we distorting our history so much? Why are we telling our children lies? Why don't we tell them the truth? Whether you like our history or not, we had good periods, bad periods, tell them the truth. Because we've been conditioned to believe that Aryans came, Ganga plain, 500 BC, chased these poor guys to the south with their swords and whips and whatnot. And so any southern Indian settlement cannot be older than 500 BC, right? Now, science says Homo erectus became extinct 600,000 years ago. Genetics says modern man entered into India 85,000 years ago. Who was making these tools? <laughs> Who was making these tools 350,000 years ago? That is the question now. There is a story today that says that Arvane originated in Central Asia and the Aryans brought it to India. And the reason why you and I have Arvane is because the Aryans from Central Asia brought Arvane to India. That is one story. Or did the Arvane originate in India and spread to the Western regions? So even the consensus among scholars appears to be that Arvane originated in India and not in Central Asia. Unfortunately, in our country, the minute a paper comes from Harvard with 90 uh, signatories in the paper or 2000 signatories in the paper, it's conflated in the news immediately saying Aryan invasion proven and all these things. How are the journalists equipped to do any of this analysis? So first of all, thank you all for coming today. So uh, it's a pleasure to be back in New Delhi. I see some familiar faces from the last time I was here. So really happy that you came to this talk. So the talk has been titled as a revisiting because the last time that I talked New Delhi, I think Rahul made an excellent video out of it that got a lot of views on uh, YouTube. So this year we are revisiting that to see what else is there uh, since the last year's narrative. So uh, this is, uh, IHAR, Indian History Awareness and Research. We are based in Houston, Bengaluru, Coimbatore, Columbus, Pune, Chennai. We are a group of uh, doctors, engineers, Vedanta scholars, uh, professors in humanity and uh, different professions. So our goal in this work is to bring in a different lens than what people are normally used to in um, the st uh, study of history. Today in history, you have an overwhelmingly social lens to look at uh, history, humanities and so on. So we, we bring the lens of um, engineering, sciences and the hard sciences, if you will. So let me straight away jump into the talk. So last year, I began the talk with the paradoxes in Indian history. So I've expanded on that. So last year, we said we have something called an evidence-based narration and a present-day narration. And our goal will be to try and evaluate where we are regarding these two things. In a sense, I predisposed it over there with a big cross mark there. <laughs> but <laughs> we will nevertheless, we'll go through these things. So we know that we are an ancient civilization, position otherwise, knowledge producers, position otherwise, strong index sources and references, but these are ignored, devalued and discredited. We have a continuity of civilization, but then there's an enforced periodization in today's history narratives, where we are told that there's something called a Harappa civilization. We don't know anything about them. We don't know what they ate, what they looked like, who they worship, nothing about them, even the script. And they're an isolate sitting out there with mostly links to Egypt and uh, Sumeria and things like that. And after that, the Aryans came along and now we have an Aryan civilization. This is what we're told. We have large periods of history that have unfortunately been erased. That's not there in today's history. This gals me. We have hundreds of rishis and Indic works that we are familiar with. Yajna Valkya, Jaimini, you name these rishis. So many of them who created enormous intellectual works. Why are they not part of a historical narrative? Do they not belong to this land? Is their works not part of the intellectual tradition of this land? So here we have a major problem when the works of rishis are completely ignored and forgotten in today's uh, narrative. We are told that the Hindu social orders blame for poverty, but then we are going to revisit this again and talk about the invasions. This we dealt with at length last year about how we are told that Indians received knowledge from Greeks and Babylonians, but we showed that Indian knowledge seeded the world. We are told that there's something called a Dravidian identity, which has been manufactured in India as a dominant way that Indians look upon themselves today. But we'll see there's no distinction between the Northern and Southern Indian. From evidence, we have that Vedic Sanskrit is one of the, perhaps the oldest uh, language that is still surviving. 
but there's a hypothetical proto-indo-european ancestor that has been created and this is how people talk about that vedic sanskrit has been derived from this ancestral language now the rig veda talks of the saraswati river which we know geologically dried up around 2000 bc but we are told that rig veda is only composed in 1500 bc a paradox so they are 500 years after the purported uh, drying up of the river they seem to be talking about flowing rivers from the himalayas down to the ocean so we have a problem there astronomy derived works show dates that show great antiquity however the upanishads the brahmanas samhitas are all dated to 500 bc to around 300 current era by the work likes of max miller weber and others we talked about this paradox last time that indian culture impacted all the lands to its north south and east but did not step one foot outside afghanistan one more of those very very strange paradoxes in indian history so we now would like to examine who are the guys who wrote our indian history and why did they even do these kinds of things so last year when i talked uh, well prior to that the untold story of indian civilization we're going to be talking about uh, the mainstream narration along these lines and we're going to see where the evidence is taking us and uh, we'll, we'll work our way through some of these things so last year i called out william jones i called out um, max miller and uh, bentley and others and risley as a guy who wrote the early indology of india and there's a reason why they did the things the way they did things for example i said that they were products of the anglican church who believed that god created the world in 4004 bce and god destroyed the world in 3000 bc noah's flood and nothing could have survived that flood event so these gentlemen, they came to India and they were shocked when they found enormous chronology in the Indian context. I saw bits and pieces in Vinodji's presentation where he's talking about the Puranic king list. And these are some of the things that they encountered and they were shocked about where does Indian history begin and where does it end? There seems to be no relation to the Western history. So they went about looking for an anchor point to see where is the anchor point in Indian history and in this history. From Majesthani's work, they knew there's somebody called Sandra Kutos. And so they phonetically tried to look at the list in the Puranic King list and they chanced upon Chandragupta Maurya and said that Chandragupta Maurya should be linked up to Sandra Kutos and that is the anchor point. Everybody's very, very happy after that. But then the problem is the Sandra Kutos they're talking about, Majesthani's time is perhaps 300 BCE and Chandragupta Maurya is dated to much earlier. So they introduced distortions in the Indian calendar by doing these false anchor points. And then they went through a process of saying, we know that the Purana king list has got a list from grandson of the Pandavas all the way to the Gupta kings. But they went about cherry picking king lists from here saying these are mythical kings, we're going to remove them out and move some people from here to here and these things to get a reduced chronology. And why the reduced chronology? Because their worldview would not allow them to accept an enhanced chronology. So we're going to get into the minds of these guys by looking at what they wrote. William Jones, he said either the first 11 chapters of Genesis are true or the whole fabric of our national religion is false in this work over here. Another place is that I'm obliged, of course, to believe the sanctity of the venerable books of Genesis. Max Muller, he says, I look upon the creation given in Genesis as simply historical. So these were the guys who were tasked by the East India Company to write the history of India. And this is the bias with which they came into the discourse. For the longest time, Indians have been happy with the Puranas. They've been happy with the Itihasas. Our notion of history has been to go to a Stala Purana and look at the temple epigraphy. We know the temple was built at a certain period of time. We've been happy with that notion of history. These guys came and uh, started imposing a certain offensive, we call it the colonial ideological offensive, where the distortion started and they became mainstream in a sense. Today we live under the Marxist ideological offensive. And these are the doyens of this, the luminaries, eminent historians, Bipin Chandra, Satish Chandra, uh, R.S. Sharma, Romila Tapar, Irfan Habib and many others who control the roost today in uh, uh, communist uh, 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 outlook or the Marxist ideological offensive. This gentleman is Bhairapa. If you Google for Bhairapa in CRT, you'll find a lot of works of his. And NCRT is particularly interesting because he was on the textbook committee of NCRT. He went to his chairman and asked, sir, why are we distorting our history so much? Why are we telling our children lies? Why don't we tell them the truth? Whether you like our history or not, we had good periods, bad periods, tell them the truth. Why do you build history on lies? 
the chairman apparently told him some things where I summarized over here where the Indus Valley civilization was disconnected from India and Hindus were made invaders or migrants in 1500 BCE supposedly to preempt the Hindu jingoism that will go around and say that Muslims were invaders in India. Before they could say that, they'll say, you too are invaders in India in 1500 BC. Nobody, there's no proof that any Hindus went around saying these things. But unfortunately, uh, this was done to preempt such a situation. Central narrative favored over rich state narratives of history. Minority sentiments are privileged. Invasive periods of Indian history is whitewashed and imagined atrocities of Indic rulers is manufactured. This even we have witnessed it when we uh, reviewed the seventh grade textbooks in a particular state, which by implication is also an NCRT. There is a uh, one paragraph that talks about Ghazni and that chapters that one paragraph says Ghazni came to India and he took took the riches of India and he built a splendid capital in Ghazna. This is one chapter on invasion period, followed by four or five lengthy paragraphs that talk about Hindu kings who supposedly destroyed temples. I have actually read this and reviewed this and expressed my outrage in the review that if they could uh, write this. So this is very, very true what Bhairapa notices. To promote Marxist values, deliberate Hindu phobic narrative is made. Distortions, erasures, biases, errors, misrepresentations are hallmark of the current narrative and we cannot build national identity with such distortions. That is the bottom line. So once again, we're going to revisit the evidence because science by its very nature keeps changing. There's new evidence coming every day. So we need to analyze where is the science taking us? What is it saying? Is it something contrary or have it, should we change our narrative because science has changed? We'll revisit some of these things. Last time we talked, we discussed these points on Aryan invasion, the antiquity of the Indian civilization, the knowledge systems for Indians, and we highlighted the absurdity of the present-day narrative. And now we will examine some of the later evidences and once again align it along these points. So just to quickly refresh your mind, the Aryan invasion theory. Every word here is important. Bands of male warriors from Central Asia invaded, migrated to India around 1500 BC. Every word is important in the battle because it's got to be bands. It can't be a huge migration group. There's no evidence in genetics. It's got to be male because the uh, maternal mitochondrial DNA is not present in the record. And it's got to be warriors because they're supposed to have got steel outside India and uh, come on chariots and all of those kinds of things. So every word here is really a, a battle cry for a narrative. So it effectively replaced the existing civilization and brought an entirely new Vedic religion, Sanskrit language and Vedic ecosystem. This is what we are told around 1500 BCE. Last time we said how this is rooted in the quest for the Western identity. Ever since William Jones found the commonality of languages, Sanskrit, um, Latin and Greek, the Western people are interested in knowing what is their identity. And that quest has led them to once again study the narrators on, along these lines. We talked about this linguistic analysis last time and then we said that uh, basically what they did was took a, a list of words, common words like a Swadesh list and other such things, took a list of common words in the uh, languages of interest and tried to see how do words change from one language to another. As an example, in Tamil, if I say come here, I'd say Inge va. In, Th in Kannada, I'd say Illi ba. So it words change slightly from one to the other and their interest was in knowing how do these words change, what is the statistical distance from one to the other. So the early ideas were on one extreme is India, other extreme is Western Europe, it's geographically and uh, literally uh, statistically. So they said where is the midpoint, Caspian Sea and uh, Black Sea, that's, the, that's where languages started. So those are the ideas with which they came about with this mythical hypothesized language called Proto-Indo-European. There is no evidence that anybody spoke this language. There is no evidence that it belonged to a geographical region. All these things are hypothesis and then uh, these things are supposed to have come from this. So we're going to revisit some of these things again. Last time we talked about this, how there's a fusion of linguistics and archaeology in the quest for Western narrator. We talked about Maria Gimbutas and Colin Renfro. 
we talked about how she says expansion of the languages happened in three ways with domestication of the horse 4000 BC to 1500 BCE and Colin Renfro who criticized this narrative and came about the Anatolian hypothesis in Turkey saying that once agriculture was invented in Turkey the spread of agriculture was also the impetus for spreading of languages whether it is a Dravidian so-called Dravidian and uh, uh, Indo-Aryan and all those kind of things each we talked about the Kurgan steppe hypothesis last time to refresh your mind 3500 BCE between the Caspian Sea and Black Sea people called Yamnaya living here at the same time that all over the world literally you have uh, civilization over there 2500 BC they have spread out to the east to the west and to the east the Corded Ware people and the Novo people 1500 BC they specialized in the Hittites Babylonians Egyptians Mycenaeans and here the BMAC culture you see them entering into Sindh and into Gujarat and that is the start of the Aryan invasion theory for us and by 500 BCE they have entrenched in the Ganga plain and you see the appearance of Dravidians in the record over here so this is what we talked about last time too and to, now we are going to investigate all of these things so the first lines of evidence I'd like to talk about is from archaeology and see what do we no, since we talked last year in archaeology that is casting little more light on who we are what is science saying how old is human habitation in india how old is human habitation in india how about one million years ago tools have been found in tamil nadu in science in march 2011 shanti papu is a researcher along with these people and they found tools in tamil nadu dating back from one million years ago how do they know the date of these tools? Because they make use of something called luminescence. Luminescence is a process where supposing you have a stone which has got some iron specks in it, right? Granite has got some iron content. It's buried under the earth. The earth's natural radioactivity makes charges to accumulate in this uh, specimen. So the longer it is under the soil, the more charge it is going to accumulate. Now when you dig that specimen and take it out, expose it to sunlight the reverse process happened the charge starts leaking away so you could take this to a lab calibrate it and figure out the rate of discharge and you could figure out what is the age of that artifact so using that uh, mechanism Shanti Papu and others have dated these artifacts at 1 million years ago here's an example of a hand axe the same one 1 million years ago if you go to Haryana in the uh, National Museum you can find this axe so when you go next to Haryana go and take a look at it and you'll see it over there have you seen it okay okay so th th this is over there so the question comes what does science tell us about the human species who are living 1 million years ago it turns out that science calls them Homo erectus so this is a uh, artistic representation of what the Homo erectus might look like. The range was all over Africa as well as India, Southeast China and uh, Southeast Asia also. They lived in social groups, used fire, cranial capacity upper limit of around 1100 cc, smaller than humans, here Homo, sa Homo sapiens, used stone tools 70 kilograms up to 6 feet tall. I put the scale here to give you an idea. 10 million years ago, what was the human uh, fossils like? wouldn't even look like homo sapiens today it might look like chimpanzees or apes in that time frame homo erectus occupies this niche according to science from 2 million years to 600,000 years ago that is what science today holds in the mainstream narrative homo erectus appeared into the record 2 million years ago became extinct around 600,000 years ago and we homo sapiens occupy this tiny niche over here 150,000 years till now so just to put things in context that one million years ago tools were by apparently this specimen then what happened is about a few months ago this paper hit us this is from a place called Athiram Pakam in Tamil Nadu where they found 350,000 years ago tools now science says Homo erectus became extinct 600,000 years ago genetics says modern man entered into India 85,000 years ago who was making these tools? <laughs> Who was making these tools 350,000 years ago? That is the question now. So it's an open question. There's no answer yet. It's the same researcher Shanti Papu and others who have been working on this. It's an open question to figure out who are these people, were they Homo erectus, some other species we don't know, or are they Homo sapiens? It's a very open question.
These are some of the artifacts from there. Archaeologists talk about tools in two ways. One is a tool which you clasp with your hand, right? It's you clasp a tool and you throw it. Another kind of tool is precision tool, where you hold it with your thumb and forefinger and you chip away at it, you know, and make it sharper and sharper. This is associated with larger cranial capacity. So normally they say Homo sapiens are the ones who make these precision tools. All these tools were precision tools 350,000 years ago. Opening the question, who made it? Homo erectus is supposed to have a lower cranial capacity. So who made this? I put an outlier over here. This is called Narmada Man. It's a skull that was discovered in Narmada Valley, 300,000 year old, in 1982, Arun Sonakia, GSI. Initially, he thought it's a Homo erectus skull. Then the French investigator measured the capacity and said it is up to 1,421 cubic centimeters of the upper lip bone, which is right where modern Homo sapiens cranial capacity is. The average for Homo erectus is 1,000 cubic centimeters in Southeast Asia, China and Africa. So this specimen is definitely larger than the so-called Homo erectus. And Kenneth, an American researcher in these papers, he says you should assign this as an early Homo sapien. So the reason why I put this is because last time when I talked, I gave the impression that genetics out of Africa it is telling us a very strong story. But science by its very nature examines evidence as it comes in. It falsifies an earlier uh, evidence. We need to change our narrative and see where are we going with this. So with this, we have to open ourselves to the possibility that there's a continuum from Homo erectus to Homo sapien and not a sharp cut off the way science is saying that two million years ago they appeared, 600,000 years ago they disappeared. Perhaps there is a continuum from there to here, at least in India. That would be the conclusion, at least looking at some of these things, until we have better evidence from science that says otherwise. So from about 40,000 years ago, these are some of the Homo sapien artifacts all over India, Soan Valley, Bias Valley, Narmada Valley, all the river valleys, north, south, east, west, you got specimens. We talked about this last time too. So what I'm doing here is I'm going starting from 1 million years ago tools, 350,000 years ago tools, 40,000 years ago, I'm going down in time in archaeology. This is a paper we talked about last time, Antiquity 2009 by Ravi Kori Setter and uh, others. So it talks about Jwalapuram, uh, where 35,000 years ago, a uh, rock shelter, they found human artifacts and other things. We talked about this too last time, Bimbetka, Edekal, Ketavaram, Birana, Ramachandrapuram, how there is rock art, ancient writing in Kerala, rock art in uh, Andhra Pradesh, and in Birana, 10,000 up to 10,000 years ago, urban artifacts have been found in, uh, in this part of the world. Birana, we know from 2,750 years before present all the way to 9,450 years, several artifacts have been found in different layers. This is from a paper in uh, ASI. This one came very, very recently, maybe just two months back or three months back, when a group of enthusiasts, they sent up a drone equipped with a video camera. Uh, era over some place in Maharashtra and to the surprise they found huge art on the ground. This art is so big that if you were to walk over there you can't see the perspective, you can't make out what it is. You need to go up in the air to see the perspective and some of these things are huge if you look at this. It's similar to the Nazca lines in Peru and Chile and those kind of places. Very similar kind of rock art being found in Maharashtra. So the, one of the archaeologists has tentatively given a date saying it is perhaps older than 10,000 years. That's in line with what we know at Bimbetka, Central uh, India, that maybe that is the antiquity of uh, this rock art. Dwaraka uh, from episodes March 2003, we know this group, National Institute of Ocean Technology Chennai, sent a ship equipped with sonar and they found a 9 kilometer long feature about 40 meters above the sea level. They also found a piece of wood which they dated in uh, Hyderabad as well as in Germany and they came back with a date of 8,500 years or 9,300 years before present for, for the artifact which could also be the age of uh, uh, the settlement or city wall that they found over there. This is a beautiful pot, Balochistan pot, 3,500 years ago. This news came out pretty recently, maybe about uh, four or five months ago, in Sanawli, Uttar Pradesh. They found chariot burials in pit uh, graves, a whole lot of them. So the archaeologist has dated that tentatively to an upper bound of 2000 BCE. We are going to revisit this again a little later. 
beautiful uh, humped bull with gold horns, 1800 BCE. Sangamira, we talked about Sangamira last time, about Kiradi, how there's an urban uh, uh, artifact found in outside Madurai, about 20 kilometers outside Madurai, some of the artifacts from there. And we talked about a controversy with this too last time, where to refresh your mind, I said that the ASI dug up to 4.5 meters, but they took samples in the 2 meter depth and sent it off to Florida for carbon dating. And they came back with a date of 3rd century BCE. And then this unfortunately may not be true because the question is what about this uh, 4.5 meters that you have excavated, you found artifacts all over the place. So I said last time that if the ASI reported 4.5 meters depth of excavation, if you take the top layer as 2018, let's change it 2018, then 2 meters down you carbon dated to 2200 years which means every meter in depth is 1,100 years linearly. I'm an engineer, this is what I do. If you don't give me any additional data, I'm going to make a linear approximation. I'm going to say everything is linear and you've given me one data point, I'm going to use that to extrapolate this entire thing until you give me better measurements, until you come and give me a non-linear measurement and such things. It's a first approximation, you go with that date. So every meter linearly corresponds to 1,100 years, which means 4.5 meters should correspond to 5,000 years before present. And that comes to approximately 3,000 BCE. Very, very odd data point sitting in southern India because we've been conditioned to believe that Aryans came, Ganga plain, find at BCE, chase these poor guys to the south with their swords and whips and whatnot. And so any southern Indian settlement cannot be older than 500 BCE. Right? According to the common narrator, if you find something in urban settlement in southern India, 3000 BC, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> so uh, I called this out last time saying ASI should have reported a range of artifacts that we got artifacts from uh, this top layer, middle layer, bottom layer, that would have been a more honest uh, representation. We also said last time that there's some politicking going on. The state has taken over Kiradi excavations. The archaeologist was transferred from there to Arunachal Pradesh or some place like that. And we don't know, we still don't have clarity. Is it the Tamil Nadu government that is doing it or is it the central government doing it? We have no idea that there is a lot of uh, to and fro and mudslinging going on over here. But my belief is that they've stopped excavating Kiradi at this point. So I don't know what is the future of the site. We talked about the glass factories of Arikamedu last time, where we said that outside uh, Puducherry, Pondicherry, the glass beads that have been found there have been dated up to 300 BCE. However, the uh, uh, archaeologist who excavated that, Vimala Begley, she said that in this diary, she had to stop working because she was under the water table and even a large pump could not keep the water out. So implying that there are artifacts waiting to be found over there, but she could not get it because of the technological issue. She can't dig deeper than that. So ASI today has covered up this Arikameda behind this Roman wall. You can uh, see a coconut grove. That's where Arikameda is. This is one of those paradoxical situations. This map is from Jijat Ravi. So on a map, if you place the names of all the places named the epics, the Itihasas, you soon find that all over India and outside India, Uttara, Kuru and others, you have names mentioned over there. So the epics are deeply tied to the geography of the land. However, we ignore the epics as sources of history. Very, very unfortunate. And we teach our children this. We teach them that there was a Indus Valley civilization disconnected with India, looking outside for trade and inspiration. And it commenced 5,000 years ago and declined 3.6 thousand years ago. And silence about any activity over here, giving children a wrong idea that there's empty lands over here. So very, very unfortunate the way our textbooks are portrayed. So that was the archaeological evidence where I presented uh, some new data talking that human habitation has been as old as one million years. And I called into question the common thinking today at least that modern man came into India from Africa around 85,000 years ago. That is called into question because of the archaeological artifacts we are finding which seem to imply there's a continuum. So it's one of those open questions as of today. We don't have a resolution one way or the other. So let's go to archaeogenetics and this is going to be a deeper talk than last time. I hope I can still hold your attention. <laughs> 
So uh, archaeogenetics, we contain records of mutations carried by all our ancient ancestors, mother's side, father's side, grandfather, great-grandfather, all those mutations because of recombination, we carry those mutations. Ostensibly, we can work backwards and we can say, if I carry this genetic structure, how is it related to some ancient specimens? Theoretically, at least we can uh, address that problem. So today people use maternal mitochondrial field data, Y chromosomal field data, genome wide data, that's uh, new these days, and mathematical analysis and inference by mapping to real world. Today the field is incredibly specialized and it is a multidisciplinary field. In fact, this is the scope of work over there. There's a field worker who goes out to the field and gets the samples and things like that. There's a lab specialist who takes this and processes the data in the lab. There's a bioinformatician who puts a mathematical model on these things. If you're relating an ancient sample to a current sample, what is the hidden Markov chain model or some other kind of model, statistical model and all these kind of things. There's a programmer who's going to write all the C++ code or something, whatever the bioinformatician is going to do. There's an applied mathematician who will help you to converge the algorithm which the programmer has got no clue about. Then finally, there is somebody who's going to interpret the results, maybe the professor who will take all the numbers and create a story connecting it to a social narrator. This field is so big, it's rare that one person has got expertise over this entire chain. So invariably, the lab specialist will have no idea what this person is talking. This person will have no idea what this person is talking. And this is the way it is. You might find rare cases from here and there where a bioinformatician can do these three jobs. And with luck, you can also dis do this job. But the bottom line is, it is a very specialized field. So it's rare to find people. There's a reason why I'm saying this. We'll find out as we go. Very quick biology lesson about uh, chromosomes. We know that we have 22 pairs called autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. The mother brings in the XX, father the XY. The daughter gets the X, one X from mother, one X from father. Son always gets X from mother, always gets Y from father. This is a recombination that we all know from high school biology. This happens at the time of conception, the meiosis, where the mother's content, father's content, replication, crossover, and there's a recombination, and the genetic material is shared, replicated, and so on and so forth. So this is the starting point for the mathematical work on understanding how these things happen. Before I embarked on my India talks, I spoke to a friend who's a professor in, uh, in Ohio in biochemistry. Two hours I talked to her to try and understand this process well. I needed to understand is this a random process or does the biochemistry of the ovum and the sperm, does that have a bearing on what is the genetic material that is uh, exchanged? After two hours we came to the conclusion that today's science says it's utterly random. There is no way that we can say which genetic content is going to be involved in this crossover. However, that is at odds with our own Garbhopanishads and other such things that talk about conception being with your past Janmas karma and other such things that will involve where we are going to. There's a connection that we don't understand that has been exposed as randomness today. So I probed this issue of randomness a little further. As a mathematician, I said, is every genome equally likely to take part in the uh, randomness? And the answer was wherever the crossover points are and wherever these things are tightly held, they will not take part in the, in the exchange. They'll be tightly held, but some other parts are more likely than other parts. So bottom line, it is not uniformly random, but there are segments in the DNA where are more likely to participate and others less likely. Bottom line is there are a lot of assumptions that are made in today's studies which have no bearing to reality. I'm going to expose some of these things. If I take a random guy from New Delhi, grab him and take his genetic profile, it's not going to give any value. It's going to be utterly useless. However, if I go to maybe 1000 households or 10,000 households in New Delhi and take their genetic samples, then pretty soon with student scoring kind of thing, such a picture is going to emerge. It'll tell me there's a pie chart where 33% of Delhi carries this mutation. 25% carry this mutation and some trace amounts for some of the mutations. Such a picture will emerge for a population as a whole. That is the whole idea. So scientists use these kind of pie charts to figure out and give markers like A, M, B, T to give an idea of how differences in genome tell a story of human migration. For example, the M marker, mostly in India and then spreading outside. The A marker, not in Africa, not in India, but outside. The B marker, only in Africa. So these things help us to understand. They tell us a story. 
based upon the statistical uh, majority of the genomes that people carry, we can start telling stories. Before 2010, it was incredibly expensive to do any kind of genetic studies. Only a few laboratories and uh, maybe universities could do that because that was the price of that. Today the price has fallen, you can go to 23andMe or somewhere for $99, you do a saliva swab, they'll give you a genetic profile and all those things. But those days it was very expensive. Plus, prior to 2010, the computing technology was not as good as it is today. So they couldn't do much of the genetic work, mathematical genetic work that I like to do. So they were forced to work with the gender chromosomes, either the maternal mitochondrial DNA or the Y chromosome will work. That was used primarily in early genetic studies to talk about the migration of humans. How did humans populate the world? mtDNA, this is the maternal mitochondrial DNA. So the early works figure out all these mutations. We are interested in the M marker for India, mostly in India and spreading out to the rest of the world. And if you look at the colors over here, you can see there's a purple color that goes somewhat like this. It's starting to tell a story, right? Just by looking at a color, you can start telling a story. Yeah, there's a difference in the genome that is inferring a pattern. It doesn't tell you the direction. It doesn't tell you the direction, but there is a movement that you can connect these two uh, kind of people. Similarly, the Y haplogroup from the male, and we are interested in R1A and R1B. R1A is mostly in India, and uh, R1B is mostly in uh, Europe. Here too, you can see the purple color, how it spreads over here. It's telling a story. So, the last time that we talked about the maternal mitochondrial DNA, I presented to you the work of Stephen Oppenheimer. And I said that his story, you can't read this, but around 85,000 years ago, a group of people left India, walked in this triangular part, generation by generation migration. Then we said 75,000 years ago, there's Mount Toba event that caused an extinction of the human race over here, leading to less than 10,000 adults were left to repopulate the world. All the non-African people of the world are derived from the 10,000 people who survived the Mount Toba event a huge volcano super in uh, Sumatra. Then we talked about how when the ice ages ended 65,000 years ago, the Neanderthals died out and humans from this part of India, they migrated across the Bosphorus and became the future Europeans. Then about 45,000 years ago, we talked about Indians from this part of India, this part of India, Sumeria, from uh, Taiwan, other places. They crossed the Siberia, the land bridge and became the future North and South Americans. This we talked about last time as a story of how humans populated the world as a function of uh, the maternal mitochondrial DNA. So this is a state of art understanding until 2003, 5 and so on. Now the maternal mitochondrial DNA is very, very stable and there's a reason for that. I don't want to go into very great detail, but it is not using the X chromosome of the mother, rather in the ovum, they find the mitochondria. It is the DNA of the mitochondria that we are tracking. And that is very, very stable. It does not mutate very often. It's very, very stable. And that is, that is why you have a very, very stable story coming over here. This story could not address the Aryan invasion theory or the Western identity problem. So people said, why don't we look at the Y chromosome? Maybe the Y chromosome has got more resolution than the maternal mitochondrial DNA. And so people start looking at the Y chromosome. So Peter Underhill, 2014, examined so many individuals, 126 populations, and uh, he said it appeared in the genetic record 25,000 years ago, uh, somewhere near Iran. And uh, one more thing is that if you want to talk about Aryans, you can't talk, use such an old mutation. You want to have data with more resolution, the time frame of interest, 6,000 years ago. Two questions have become prominent. Where did the R1A originate? Underhill says Iran, but is it a done story or are there more people saying different things? There is a story today that says that R1A originated in Central Asia and the Aryans brought it to India. And the reason why you and I have R1A is because the Aryans from Central Asia brought R1A to India. That is one story. Or did the R1A originate in India and spread to the Western regions? So to address that question, I took a look at several researchers, Bashu 2003, Kevisil and others, all the way to Thangaraj in 2010, to see their opinion on R1A. Where did R1A originate? So Bashu says Central Asia, Kevisil says Southern Asia. 
Sen Gupta says North India, Tanseem says Southern Asia, South Asia, Northwestern India, South Asia, South Asia. So even the consensus among scholars appears to be that RNA originated in India and not in Central Asia. If you look at all the studies by these people, so it turns out that mtDNA and Y chromosome are indicating an Indic origin. It fails to validate the linguistic model. These are the results as of 2010. Then what happened? The superstar professor came on the scene. His name is Professor David Reich, brilliant man from uh, Harvard University. And he wrote this book, Who We Are and How We Got Here. This book was published sometime in April or May of uh, this year. And he said, since the empty DNA and the Y chromosome are not telling a story that we want, why don't we look at the remaining 22 autosomes? Why are we only looking at the gender chromosomes? We still have 22 autosomes. So let us look at the 22 autosomes to see if there's evidence of RNA invasion theory or the identity issues. This is called genome-wide data. So the first thing that he did is try to take ancient samples that you might be able to recover entire uh, genome record. For example, Harappa skeletons. If they are 5,000 years old, can you go and get maybe from the bones or teeth, maybe you can find some genetic record. The problem is the ancient samples are invariably contaminated by bacterial DNA. So the human DNA is mixed with bacterial DNA. After thousands of years, right, bacteria is going to work and so you have contamination. Next thing is, if a sample has been under the soil, under water, salt water for a long time, the mineralization, that breaks down the DNA also and you can't get the samples. So scientists today with laborious laboratory methods, they're able to extract pieces of the genome, one piece from here, one piece from here, one piece from here and so on. Then they need to fill in the blanks. And to fill in the blanks, they make use of present day human DNA as well as chimpanzee DNA. They use both to reconstruct the ancient fragments and David Reach says this in page 30 to 33 on how he takes the samples. David Reach concluded some very strange things that I'd like to talk about. I'm not going to read all these things. He said Europeans are more closely related to Indians than to the Chinese. Indians, Europeans, closely related. Then he also said Chinese are more closely related to Indians than the Europeans. So any logical person, and I'm sure all of us in this room, will say the model is Indians are the common link. From Indians you get uh, Europeans one side, Chinese on the other side. However, he didn't do that. Deferring to the Aryan invasion theory, he introduced one layer of abstraction. He said, let there be a hypothesized proto-Indo-European people over here, from whom are derived the Europeans and the Indians. So bottom line, I'm calling out the model validity. What is the model that you did? You selected a model that conveniently goes in a circular argument and fits the RNA invasion theory. And you're going to now do some mathematical analysis and befuddle the entire world with it. And nobody understands what the math is. We're going to go with detail on all of these things. So there are some problems over here. I'm not going to read all these things. So this is the claims as of August of 2018 of this year on the genetic research. It says the present day Indians have strong affinity to ancient Iranian farmers. 9,000 years ago, we are told the pastoral people from Iran came and pervasively mixed with Northern Indian and Southern Indian. All of us have this uh, uh, DNA from Iranians. Then present day Indians have strong affinity to ancient steppe pastoral people 4,000 years ago. This is Aryan invasion theory. So from Central Asia, people came 4,000 years ago. So 9,000 years ago, Iranians came mixed with everybody. Then 4,000 years ago, uh, Central Asians came and they mixed. This is the story. I'm not going to go very deep into all of this ANI and ASI, which is basically, there are some issues over here. What I'd like to do is bring out a couple of contradictory research. This came out in BioArchive in uh, uh, March uh, 2018, Vagish Narsimhan. Priya Murjani and uh, David Reich and others. This paper, when they're talking about a South Asian genomic formation, they claim admixture from Yamnaya. Admixture is a fancy word that says if you have two ancient populations, the Indian and maybe Central Asian, these populations mix and makes a hybrid, that is admixture and their uh, generations come down to us. So that is the admixture model. So they are claiming this admixture from Yamnaya. 
However, this second paper that came out in May 2018 by some Scandinavian professors, it gets a diametrically opposite result saying there is no admixture from Yamnaya. So I came and asked how is this possible? How is it that two research teams ostensibly using similar people's data, ancient people from Central Asia, ancient people from India, present day samples of India, but they're coming with different conclusions. How is that possible? So as an engineer, I wanted to, scientists want to question that. What, what is going on? Is there a methodological problem, research problem, or is there some other issue over here? Let's investigate a bit. So I'd like to talk to you about this rebuttal paper that was written by Dr. Premendra Priyadarshi and Murli Vadivelu in September of 2018 of this year. So what they did was something very, very interesting. To give you an idea of how this works, supposing there is a village, let's say in Tamil Nadu, remote village in Tamil Nadu, where there are 95 people living 1000 years ago. Among this 95 people, five foreigners from Scandinavia come and live over there 1000 years ago. After 1000 years, I studied the genetics of the descendants and I find overwhelmingly these five people's DNA is present and the 95 people who lived there, they are absent. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So this is the nature of the work that they wanted to rebut. So they took figure three from this paper and they worked the mathematics. They said, let's work the mathematical model and figure out if you're claiming that there's so much a percentage of uh, Central Asian uh, DNA content in present Indians, let's work backwards and find out how many immigrants came to India so that genetically they will overwhelm the existing population and give these numbers. Their research found up to four times the immigrants must have come into India. To give you an idea, Saraswati Sindhu civilization supported between 2 million to 5 million. That is our estimate of how many, what is the population like. At the upper end, 5 million, you multiply it by 4, 20 million people came from Central Asia to India to overwhelm us all genetically so that you and I today carry their genetic content with the claimed percentages that they are talking about. That is the nature of the work which they did and they called out the absurdity saying desert, arid, Central Asia sent four times the population. <laughs> this is why it's important to say bands of male warriors came. They didn't come 20 million in a chain walking to India, there's no evidence. So they converted the story saying bands of them started coming trickling in from time to time. It's a very strange story. It doesn't bear out. Whichever way you look at it, there's a problem over here. So I put one more paper here to show you the dramatic impact of sampling on the results. This is from a genetics in 2015 written by some French professor. So what he did was, let me give you an example. Supposing I go to an IT park in Gurgaon and take about 100 guys from there, the genetic sample, and I say I'm going to talk about genetics of New Delhi with these guys. Is that valid? It's not because there are guys from West Bengal, from Karnataka, from Punjab, all of the place come and work in the IT park. So that's not a valid sample. This researcher said, if I'm going to admit your sample, I require that you be living in the same place as your grandfather. If you live in the same place as your grandfather, then I will take a genetic sample. So there's some notion of stability. Once you start for three generations, you live in the same place. It makes sense. So by using grandfather's uh, uh, location, he tried to say what is the most common recent ancestor, the most recent common ancestor. He said the Z93 in Pakistan and India, the most recent common ancestors 15,000 years ago. In contrast to David Reich, who says the most common recent ancestor is 4,000 years ago. Do you see that? David Reich's result saying the most common recent ancestor of Central Asia and Northern India is 4,000 years ago. These guys, the different kind of sampling are saying 15,000 years ago you have a common ancestor. So this is just giving an idea that the methodology has got enormous problems which the common person does not understand because there are so many details over here. I'm going to give you a little flavor of that and I hope I still hold your attention. Uh, this is in 2015, Hereditary Genetics by uh, Lukert. You can look, look this paper up if you like. And when was that book written? This book was written in uh, this year. It came out this year. I'm not going to go all the way back, but it came out this year in April or May of 2015, uh, 18. Did that get access to this? 
<laughs> when, when you're a superstar professor, you only rely on your Harvard University results. <laughs> you don't look at others' results. There's a, there's a hierarchy there also. There's a snobbery and hierarchy. What results you're going to take? Whose results are you going to refer to? It, there's a lot of snobbery in research. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so two studies, two results. How is that possible? One person takes ancient samples, maps it to present day samples and it says 100 generations. Another takes the same ancient samples but a different population distribution and gets 150 generations. How is that possible? So I just put down some ideas here. I'm not going to go into great detail on these things. There are two main methods today in mathematics for ancestry estimation. One is model based. The model base is used for admixture, where they say if I got some ancient samples from the past, maybe Harappa skeletons or Central Asia skeletons, and I've got present day samples, my goal is to work backwards from the current sample and look at the admixture. When was the last admixture possible? That is a goal. So it's like a computer science problem where you start working backwards and doing things. There are some issues as with that we'll talk about that later. So they use statistical models with unknown coefficients and these are some of the admixture uh, software that they do. On the other side, they do algorithm-based estimation. We'll talk about this a little later, PC analysis. I call out all of these things because this is my bread and butter for the last 30 years. As an engineer, this is what I do for a living. I work with models, I do model curve fitting and I do analysis of that, I do convergence, I write algorithms. This is what I do. And I know all the problems over here. What are the assumptions that you have? What have you encoded into your study with assumptions? Is your model appropriate? We saw how David reached, instead of using the obvious model, use an abstraction. So right there you have a problem. How does a problem scale? Does it converge? What is the initialization? Because a nonlinear problem, where you start matters a lot. If there's only one solution, no problem. Wherever you start, maybe you land to that one solution if it's a linear case. However, if it is nonlinear and admits multiple answers, then where you start has got a great bearing on where you're going to land up. That is the nature of nonlinear systems. So how do you initialize that? Then there are some technicalities on uh, the Hessian and other such things. Global optimality. Are you sure you got the best answer? I told you that a nonlinear system can admit multiple answers. You get a answer. Is it the answer? That is the question. And then how many solutions are there? Because a nonlinear system can admit multiple solutions. So you got one particular solution. How do you claim that's canonical or something so important? So I'm calling out this thing saying, just because convergence was obtained, does not confer a certificate of correctness on your result. It is only a mathematical exercise where you take a model, take some data, do a curve fitting, claim convergence. That's all it is. It's a mathematical exercise. It does not confer any kind of correctness unless you can prove a lot of things about all of these things. Unfortunately, we have seen circular arguments here and things like that. To give you an idea, some models for admixture. Here is one model called continuous gene model. There could be two ancient populations, one and two, and they create a hybrid with some percentage of genetic content. And going into the next generation, population one does not give its genetic content, only population two continues to uh, give its genetic content, and you make a hybrid. This, for example, could be the model in the United States, where the, this is the black population and the white population. And they mix, make a hybrid, but because of their power structure, the black does not uh, mix. It's a white who continues to give the genetic content going down. So this could be a model over there. Graduate admixture, population one, population two, make a hybrid in some percentage, and they continue to give their genetic content in future generations also. That's another model. Model three is hybrid isolation. Population one, population two, make a hybrid. Then they stop giving their content. Hybrid continues in uh, generation one, two, three, four, by themselves. So even in biology, you have many, many models. Which model did you use for India? Admixture with Yamnaya, which model did you use? Did you use this or did you use this? This is the question. You have problems over here. If you say bands of male warriors came, then I need to know if both populations made hybrid. When did they come and uh, when did they give their content? We have problems. There's no data. Nothing's available. Or if you say only one, 20 million people came in population one and population two and they stopped, that also needs to be called out and said, this is what I'm doing. So we have enormous problems in the modeling phase, phase itself. This is the issue. I'm going to give you a thought experiment. 
In this thought experiment, you assume that there's an ancient population and you know the exact ancient population, you have the DNA profile exactly and know the exact numbers. In other words, you say, I know all my grandparents who lived 1000 years ago. I know exactly who lived in this time frame. I also had the genetic by some magic. I know the genetics. So these are the, let's say this color, this color, this color, and this color. Then several generations, there's recombination in this population. They are mixing, marrying, and all those kind of things. At every stage, assume you know the exact descendants, exact number of generations, exact pairing, who married whom, you know all that data. Then today you have this completely mixed up color from these four colors, the present day population. And here you know the exact descendants in the pool. Only the direct descendants are here, nobody else, and you have the exact profile. Even in this exact scenario, to work out from this, to go back to this, to figure out who inherited from whom and how much, is something that we call an NP-hard problem in computer science. Theoretical complexity, the computational complexity is exponential which means it's incredibly difficult even in the exact case to go backwards in the trees and work backwards and say, how did the recombination happen? Now let's go to the non-ideal case. Let's just change one thing. I know all these things, but I don't know the exact pairings in the pool. I don't know who married whom. It introduces one level of complexity. So here, if you're working backwards, now you have to search over all the possible pairings here over all the possible pairings, then you work out to see how does this map to that. This is where we are today. You don't know the ancient population. You don't have the DNA profile exactly. You don't know their exact numbers. You don't know the exact descendants. Don't have the exact number of generations. Don't know the who married whom. Have no, don't know the exact descendants. No idea if only direct descendants are here. You don't have the exact DNA profiles either. So this is the model which people have today. And it is this model that they're taking, applying mathematics, giving you an answer, and claiming to write these global papers with global claims about who came to India at one time frame and where. I hope I've given you a flavor for the mathematical issues and technological issues. I'm deconstructing the research methodology and saying there are problems everywhere. You cannot take these results and start doing things. So they use assumed statistical models, assumed parameters, do some curve fitting, there's limited predictability with uh, these things. On the other side, this is the admixture problem. There is one more problem called PCA. PCA is called principal component analysis. In that analysis, what they do is if you have a matrix where this is geographical region one, region two, region three, for example, you start from southern India, say this village, work your way to the north, this village, this village, this village, village by village you go. And you take the different markers, you find out the DNA uh, profile and say 30% of them are carrying this marker, 20% this markers, and so on. You identify these various markers they are carrying and you have a matrix. If you do something called singular value decomposition, how many are engineers here? Ah, some are engineers. So you might have heard singular value decomposition somewhere in your past. <laughs> Once you do this uh, mathematical algorithm, it gives you a bunch of numbers called principal components. So basically, David Reich is taking the largest principal components, P1 and P2, and he's placing these regions over here. Which uh, region, how does it fit in this graph over here? And then he gets a gradient. Based on that gradient, he says the northern Indian population is closer to Central Asia. Southern Indian population is an isolate. Therefore, he got the ANI and the ASI. However, what they have done to get a gradient is, in the southern Indian sample, they've included the Andamanese. They included the Andaman DNA along with the southern Indian sample, so that there's a clustering possible to create an artificial gradient. The Andamanese stopped mixing with the mainstream population 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. Why would you include them in today's narrative of who we are, even if you're interested in uh, 5,000 year old data, and the money shouldn't be there. <laughs> they just simply shouldn't be there in the data. So you skewed your data, skewed the numbers in your matrix so that you'll get a kind of a result that will do what you want to do. So whether it is admixture or PCA analysis, I'm claiming that one has got to do great diligence. Why did you put those numbers? Why did you put the antimonies? Why did you choose a model that is circular in argument? 
So many questions can be raised. A good peer reviewer would do all of these things. Unfortunately, like I told you, it's a multidisciplinary field. Nobody's got the expertise of the data to span across this. The guy who's an expert in biology has no clue of mathematics. The guy who knows mathematics doesn't know biology. So who's going to peer review these papers? <laughs> So this is the problem. The papers get admitted, there's not sufficient peer review and uh, all kinds of issues happen. To close out this section, I'd like to give you one example that talks about circular logic. This is from a paper in 2015 from uh, California Berkeley in language. So these people went about to fuse linguistics and genetics. Okay? They wanted to say, let's apply our known knowledge of linguistics and no knowledge of genetics and see whether some of our models are fitting, including RN invasion, all these kind of things. They took a dictionary of 200 words and they did this very strange thing. All these, these are all the various people. You can't read it from there, but uh, trust me, and I can't read it from here. So <laughs> various people over here and these links over here say how genetically close these people are to these people. So these black bars over here, that is saying how close they are. For example, this is far from here. This is far from here. These are very closely related. So these are ancestral constraints, the clade constraints of the black bars. In addition, they also took time bars, time constraint, time constraint. Linguistic model gives you time, how old is Sanskrit, when did it diverge from some other language. So Sanskrit, Vedic Sanskrit, they put here to around uh, 3000 or some such thing. The next closest to that is the Hittites. Hittites are over here. Nobody speaks Hittite anymore. Ancient Greeks are over here. Assyrians, Tocharian and other languages are here. So they took the time constraints given by linguistic models and they took the genetic constraints given by people like David Reich and others. Then let's, let's now start a mathematical problem trying to see does a model converge and said, aha, it converges. It observes closeness to the Steppe hypothesis. Unfortunately, the whole thing is a circular argument. The genetic model is a circular argument. Linguistic model is a self-fulfilling uh, circular argument. The whole thing is an exercise in mathematics with no bearing to reality at all. But these papers are published. <laughs> so my conclusion has not changed from last year, where I'm saying that the genetic studies uses preconceived models and markers as constraints. Results are not primary evidence. They can only serve as supporting evidence. One will have to see sensitivity of results to population size, composition and assumptions. Just like I said last year, what will happen if I take a few pieces of data out and put some other pieces of data in? How are your results going to change? As an engineer, that's what I do. When my team comes and tells me that here's a model that is working beautifully, I will do the diligence and say, all right, I'm going to remove this data out, do the studies again. Does a, is a conclusion similar? How robust is your conclusion? If I took this pieces of data out and it converts to an entirely different answer, that means your model depends strongly on these few data points. You see what I'm saying? So that is a sensitivity. You need to study sensitivity. Then the composition. What is a composition? Am I going to take data from the IT park in Gurgaon or am I going to go and say you better be living the same place as your grandfather for me to take your data? So that one and the size, how many am I going to admit? If I'm going to talk of the size of the Indian population, am I going to take 1000 Brahmins and about 10 Shudras and something else and say I've got a genetic profile of Indians? It's a problem there too. What percentage are you going to take? Because of endogamy, we have got some certain differences in us. So what are you going to take? So all kinds of issues are there and you need to be careful over there. You need to be careful in attempting to align mathematical numbers alongside a narrative and avoid subjective biases to creep into the result. The reason is like this, like I said last time, supposing after all this convergence analysis, you go and give the professor all your numbers, I got all these numbers, this person is closely related to this, this one is closely related to that. And the difference between uh, this group of people and this group of people is 0 0.001. And you say that 0.001 is enough for me to differentiate these populations. Just a number. My question is, how did you calibrate that? Why is 0.001 significant in your data? You need to do talk to me about scaling. You need to talk to me about significance of the numbers before you come and say that this much resolution is enough to say these people are different from that. That is a problem in that ASI, ANI model. You had to put Andamanese people to create an artificial gradient between North Indian and South Indian. If you throw out that uh, Andaman is DNA, there is no genetic difference between the North Indian and South Indian from, from the supposed pastoral people. <laughs> 
So you see what I'm saying? One has got to be super careful when you do all of these kind of studies. So a good critique is going to go and check all of these things and figure out what is happening before you admit some of these things. Unfortunately, in our country, the minute a paper comes from Harvard with 90 uh, signatories in the paper or 2,000 signatories in the paper, it's conflated in the news immediately saying Aryan invasion proven and all these things. How are the journalists equipped to do any of this analysis? <laughs> So we have a very, very big problem. Next time somebody talks about these things, I hope you'll be able to get out there and uh, rebut on basis of some of these things. So I'd like to now uh, talk about other evidence not fitting with the Aryan invasion theory hypothesis. First thing is continuity of civilization. This is uh, archaeologist, very uh, revered man, B.B. Lal. And he's one of India's greatest archaeologists. He's alive even today, 98 years old or so, a very aged gentleman. So initially, when he found the painted grey ware in Haryana and he uh, dated it to around, I don't know, uh, 1700 BC or whatever, and he came and said there's no evidence for Ramayana or Mahabharata, he was a darling of the Marxist initially. Later on, as he found more and more evidence that seems to go against that, he became an outcast. The, they no longer took his <laughs> works. So he wrote an article, you can search for continuity of civilization by B.B. Lal. There's a paper by him available on Google and you can read that. So he shows in various things, for example, the proto-Shiva symbol, the swastika symbol. I went to Lothal a few years ago and with my daughter and we were walking and I find the bricks with the swastika symbol on that. And I was so naive, I asked, are these bricks new? The man said, why would we put new bricks over here? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the old Harappa bricks with swastika on them. So even today you go to Lothal, which is outside Ahmedabad, and you'll be able to see the swastika symbols on those things. Then he uncovered terracotta figurines, which seem to show the Sindur symbol. Even today in India, some married women wear the Sindur symbol. And here's an instance of cultural continuity of a tradition. You see that? There's a tradition that has been continued from Harappa times to present times. That is what he's showing over here. Then a figure showing Namaste pose. Namaste is a deeply Vedantic concept that says the Narayana in me is bowing to the Narayana in you. That is the Namaste pose. A Vedantic concept seems to be embedded in a terracotta figurine in Harappa. Then uh, S.R. Rao, another archaeologist, he found a Shivalinga in Kalibangan. And uh, S.R. Rao and B.B. Lal found several terracotta figurines showing yoga asana positions. Bottom line is, there appears to be a continuity of ideas rather than a periodization. It's not that there's an isolate called Har Harappa living here and then there is uh, Aryans that came here. Rather, there's a continuity in traditions, continuity in ideas and such things. B.B. Lal presents a lot more evidence on archaeology, on, uh, sorry, on agriculture and several other things. So I recommend reading his original paper to see this. Here are some researchers who are all working on similar ideas of continuity of civilization. Dr. Srini Kalyan Raman, Raja Ram, Srikant Thalagiri, Professor Subhash Kak, David Frawley, Conrad Elst, uh, Kazanas. Lots of people are working on similar ideas of uh, continuity of civilization. Here's a paradox. We are told that Iron Age was ushered in India by invading Aryans in 1500 BC, whether it is N.R. Banerjee 65 or Tiwari in 2003, they talk about iron. However, this news item came out in 2015 and Professor K.P. Rao, he found several artifacts, knives and blades in Telangana and he sent it off to a lab in Hyderabad for testing, luminescence testing and the date was, range was 1800 to 2400 BCE. That is the date of iron in Telangana. And I've just put the date as 2200 over here. So this completely invalidates the idea that iron was invented somewhere in Central Asia and they made swords and they were better than Bronze Age swords and they came and overwhelmed the civilization. This is uh, uh, evidence that proves otherwise over here. Other paradox, we already talked about this. We are told Aryans brought horse and chariots to India. And we are also shown, if you remember David Wood's uh, documentary on India, he shows this chariot burial, 4,000 year old chariot burial in Georgia. And he claims that because there is a chariot on the way to India, on the way to India, he claims that is how this proof that Aryans came to India. However, now you have not one, not two. They found maybe 10 to 15 uh, pit burials with chariots in them. 
with Bronze Age uh, weapons also in them. So that completely overturns this false thinking over here. And here also is a Harappa Bronze National Museum, 2000 BCE. This is also dated around 2000 BCE. This is a very interesting paper. So this came out in May 2018 in Current Science from Institute of Paleo Sciences in Lucknow. These are the professors. And they found evidence of paddy cultivation in the Ganga Plain dating back to the Holocene era. So their date comes to around 9,000 years ago, but Holocene is actually from 12,000 years ago. This completely invalidates the claim that agriculture was invented in Turkey in 6500 BCE and spread to India. Because you're seeing paddy itself in India in this time frame, according to this paper. This is a very interesting paper. This is from uh, uh, Dr. Premendra Priyadarshi. He called this out. This is in uh, Genome Biology, I think in 2007. And the researcher there wanted to find out where is the genomic ancestor of all the house mice? Where is it from? And to their surprise, they found the ancestor of the mice is in India. <laughs> and it goes back to 12,000 years. So it's from India to Madagascar, India to Northern Africa, India to West, uh, Western Europe, to China, to Southeast China, Southeast Asia, all these places. It's from India, it goes there. Why is it relevant? Because we know that mice go where there is paddy. You store paddy in your storeroom, mice are going to come. And as agriculture is going to the rest of the world, mice scamper along and go along with uh, the paddy. Right? So it is in very, very interesting to correlate this data point and this researcher has got nothing to do with this researcher and look at these two side by side and it seems to say agriculture also was invented in India and you look at the genome of uh, mice, it's telling a strong story too. So once again we come to the same conclusion that we did last year, there's no change in that with science, <laughs> our invasion theory is false. Archaeology shows ancient artifacts that predate the invasion period, North, West, South, Central India. We are seeing a human continuum for one million years, at least in India. Genetic evidence of great antiquity of the Indian people. The empty DNA markers in r a show robust presence in India. Then I also put this box over here for this year to say, what is our internal evidence? Is there any internal evidence? Remember, we are a secular people and we don't consider internal evidence. So anyway, let's take a look at what it says. Is there any support for migrations or any such thing? And it says the Vedas and Puranas talk about the Anu and the Drihyu. These are Vedic, Vedic tribes. And they're supposed to have migrated out of India. And there are some people who say that migration was from Punjab to Gandhara area. This evidence is ignored. This evidence is then Bhagavata Purana, Vishnu Purana, Vayu Purana, Brahmanda Purana, Matsya Purana, as well as Rig Veda. All these verses are all talking about a migration. It's not just in one Purana. Many of them are talking about it. But we don't care about this, right? <laughs> so I'm bringing up the preposition. If this migration would have happened around 9,000 years ago, could that account for the data point that is seen in Rish's work, where he's saying that there is ancient farmer, Iranian farmer DNA in India? He got the direction wrong. <laughs> Maybe the direction is this side. Maybe that's what it is. And then later on, the drying up of Saraswati in 2000 BC or so resulted in outward migration. We know about the Hittites, Mitannis, who spoke uh, Sanskrit and so on. Egypt, the Hyksos people, who were supposed to have been isolated in their culture, till that the Nubians were there and other such people, suddenly these people appear on the scene and people are thinking they were Indians who went over there. Maybe this can account for genetic closeness to Central Asia in addition. The 4,000 years ago, when you see there's a genetic content there, again, the direction is wrong. Maybe the direction is this way. So I'm just calling that out. So maybe if I had access to the data, I as a mathematician would love to have a model that says out of India, two time frames during the Rig Vedic period and during this period, drying up of Saraswati and fit the data that we have. I'm willing to bet it'll be a beautiful fit with no contradictions. <laughs> so, However, nobody does that because people are funded by NSF, mm -hmm. National Science Foundation and other such things. They can't give a proposal, research proposal that says, I'm going to have outlandish theory of out of India. So the only thing they can say is, I'm fitting it with a known uh, PIE, proto-Indo-European theory, I'm going to validate that. That will get funded. 
this is not going to get funded. So researchers have got constraints too in what they uh, take for these things. But I really wish some uh, Indic uh, scholars will take this up and study this. Might show some very interesting things. So we talked about this last time, what caused the collapse of uh, Indus Valley civilization? If Because we are told that invading Aryans caused a collapse. We know a 200 year drought cycle doomed it. The monsoons failed for 4,200 years, uh, sorry, uh, 4,200 years ago, monsoons failed for 200 years. We have evidence that once the monsoons failed, the glacier fed rivers gradually thinned out. There's evidence of that. If you look at the internal evidence, Balarama is supposed to have done civil engineering works to get water to Dwaraka. Again, we are a secular people and we don't care about these kinds of things. But there is some evidence that there is a desperation in the people when monsoons had failed. Today in India, if monsoon fails for one year, a GDP will go down. If monsoon fails for five years, I don't know what is going to happen. Maybe widespread famine would happen, inflation and other things would happen. Can you imagine 200 years? 200 years of monsoons have failed. So this would have called for dramatic measures of people's civil engineering works, desperation to get water when everything fails, you leave everything. Whether you live, built a magnificent Mohenjo-daro, magnificent shipyard at Lothal, you leave everything and you go where water is. You can't take the buildings on your back. <laughs> you leave everything and go. So that's, that's what appears to have happened in uh, Indus Valley civilization. So last time we talked about poverty, I'd like to talk once again about this. We are told that the Vedic system, the caste system, kept the lower classes in their positions without giving them access to studies and other such things and that accounts for widespread poverty in India. So that is what Marxists would like you to believe and that's what has been pushed in the textbooks. I'd like to see what will happen. Angus Madison, historical economist, talks about the GDP of India at 33% as the world GDP in one, going down to 2003, up to 2003. You see it's going through a period of decline over here through invasion periods, a small rise during Maratha consolidation, and then the colonialist and a rapid decline fortunes of India when Western Europe goes up. The idea from a mile high view is that a transference of wealth from India into Western Europe caused poverty in India. However, this is hiding a lot of things. There are maybe 100 PhD theses waiting to be written over here about the micro stories. There are lots of human interest bottom level stories that is not told by this graph. It, everything is embedded over here. First thing I like to call your attention to is, as an engineer, I love doing this. Let's extrapolate backwards. <laughs> Let's extrapolate backwards. <laughs> what is it telling you? It's telling you if you take this graph at 33% and go backwards in time, the slope is more and more positive, meaning that India was a very, very rich nation in the past. When I gave this talk in Chennai, I was fortunate that Dr. Srini Kalyan Raman, he came to the talk. He's a director of Saraswati Research Center. And he said, do you notice if you push this graph all the way back to the Harappan times, we have one of the most rich people and all his work, Srini Kalyan Raman, has been working on the wealth of ancient India was based on metal works. His research shows how there was a trade from Mekong Valley in uh, Vietnam all the way to Haifa in Israel. There was metal works which was going through the Mekong River, Brahmaputra River, the Ganga River, the Sindhu Saraswati, Indus, and the land route up to Haifa. And he says the Harappa people were the center of all of this action. And they were experts at metalworks. They were the ones who invented bronze. Somebody over here figured out that you take copper and add tin to it, it's going to become bronze. They were the ones who were doing metalworks. It is this that contributed to the wealth of ancient India. Here's an amazing observation that uh, Srini Kalyan Raman made. I thought I'll talk about that. Next thing I'd like to talk about, today if I take somebody from the streets of New Delhi and ask, what are your aspirations? He's going to say, I'd love to have a bungalow in the richest part of New Delhi. I don't know what that is. Maybe where Janpat is somewhere, a bungalow by themselves. And then he'd say that I'd love to have an Audi car maybe and uh, send my children to rich schools and maybe take a vacation in Europe, wear expensive clothes. These are the aspirations. And the money goes to all these various people. Let me take the question back 200 years, 200 or 300 years ago, you asked an ordinary Joe off the road, what are your aspirations? He's going to say, oh, I'd like to have some clothes to wear. 
I'd like to have some pots and pans so my wife can do some cooking. I'd love to buy the lady some jewels so that she can wear some jewels. And these are my aspirations. This is what I'd like to do. I ask a question, who made all these things in India? Who made the textiles? Who made the pots and pans, metal or earthen? Who made the jewels? It was the potter, it was the ironsmith, it was the goldsmith, it was the farmers, it was the textile worker. And who were these guys? Were they Brahmins? No, they were all the so-called, so-called lower classes and the shudras. The artisans were all this lower class and they were the ones with this 33 percent. This is hiding that piece of data. It's not the Brahmins who were the richest over there. It's the so-called lower classes in India. They produced every good of interest for the economy. So the economy was propped up by them and people wanted the Indian works. That's why it was uh, a very, very high GDP. Then we talk, focus on this rapid decline and see what is going on over here. So in 1700, the East India Company came to India and they left a lot of census on the schools and other things, the records and Dharampal went to England and he studied these things. I recommend the book A Beautiful Tree and you can download that and read it. He's given a census of these schools. So he says every village in India that had a temple had a school also in it, which means we had hundreds of thousands of schools all over India. There are several things that jump out at you. First thing is why did India need so many schools? The economy was like that. Second thing he says, what was the composition of the school? He says more than 50% were the so-called lower classes and a few more in the forward classes here and there and Brahmins about 5 to 6% in each of these schools. Next thing Dharampal notes, the British asked about the model for the school. Who is funding the school? Is it the Raja? And they found that no, it is a local population that is supporting the school. So the people in that village would give a portion of the produce every year to the village temple and in return the priest would teach their children. The farmers children, the artisans children, everybody's children are taught and they would support the economy in a certain way. This is the model that is used in ancient India. I have anecdotal evidence because my wife's family also used to do that. They had ancestral lands and a, produce of, a portion of the produce would be given to the kanchi mutton in southern India. That was a practice they had for a long time till it stopped because of economics and things like that. So given that model, I'd now like to talk to you about a second anecdote. I'm going to connect the dots. I'm going to give a second anecdote. United States chanced upon a bigoted thing called the manifest destiny. It was thought to be the white man's privilege from God, the divine right from God, because you must go back to the story of Noah and his sons Ham and others. Ham was a cursed son who was made to support all the other sons. With that idea, the white people said, we have God's mandate to civilize the world, to control and civilize the world, and they had to serve us. That was the basis of slavery in the United States and for eradicating the Native Americans and all those things. At the same period of time, the British took inspiration from that and we got a bigoted law here called the Doctrine of Lapse. So Dalhousie brought the Doctrine of Lapse fully encouraged by this manifest destiny. You can read some works that show the connections between these two ideas over there. So this one says that if a British protectorate dies without a male son, then the British will take over that land. That was the Doctrine of Lapse. I'd like to tell you the story of Tanjavur. How many know where Tanjavur is? A lot of, almost everybody knows. Southern India, Tamil Nadu, beautiful place. Tanjavur has been the richest place in India for the longest time because it is in the delta of the Kaveri River. The Kaveri River gave three paddy crops in a year because you have a very strong sunlight there and other such things. Three paddy crops. On the riches of the Kaveri Delta, the Cholas, for example, they built a magnificent Brihadishwara temple. Kumbhakonam, you go, you find millions, thousands of temples over there. They built a powerful navy that should go to Southeast China and all these things. It is because of the riches of the Kaveri Delta. The Cholas went up, declined at some point. We can talk about that later, why they declined. But that vacuum was filled in later on by the Vijayanagar. Vijayanagar Empire came and protected this area from the Muslim invasions. Then when the Vijayanagar Empire fell, the Maratha rulers who were the chieftains under Vijayanagar, they took over Tanjavur. Now approximately in this time frame, 1700s, the French had landed in Tamil Nadu. The French teamed up with Hyder Ali and they started attacking Tanjavur. So the ruler, Shivaji II, he took the protection of the British to chase away these guys. Unfortunately, the poor chap died without a son and the British annexed Tanjavur through the doctrine of lapse. 
Overnight, the tax in Tanjavur changed from an enlightened 15% to more than 56%. To more than 56% the tax has changed. When that happened, the population could not afford to pay the tax. The farmers could not afford to pay the tax. The Vaishyas could not afford to pay the tax. The system started collapsing. Once they could not afford to pay the tax, the British started confiscating. So who are all the people disenfranchised? The Kshatriyas, the landlords, the zamindars, all were disenfranchised by the British power grab. The farmers and the artisans, Vaishyas were all dis disenfranchised because of the taxes. The farmer could no longer give a portion of his produce to the temple. So the learning in addition collapsed in India and the Brahmin was also out of a job. In that period of time, the British took the money from the taxes and the artisan knowledge. They didn't have knowledge of making muslin or textiles or even steel. At that time, southern India had Uruk. Uruk is uh, wood steel. You had that. Besama was not invented yet. Besama was a driving process of industrial revolution. That is later. So they took all of this knowledge, including mathematics, sciences and other things, with the money, sponsored their industrial revolution. So instant industrial revolution ramped up and the finished goods were forced upon Indians. Suddenly, Indians are buying goods from Lancashire, Manchester and all these places. And guess who was out of a job? The artisans. Nobody would buy the artisans products anymore. Widespread poverty all over India, whether it is in the Brahmin class, the Kshatriya class, the Vaishya class or the so-called artisan Shudra class. Everybody was impoverished by the British policy. That is hiding here. That is hiding over here. This is the reason why M.K. Gandhi came and begged people, wear khadi, don't uh, take foreign clothes. Because he was an eyewitness. He was an eyewitness to the depredation of the British. And he was saying, don't do that. Let's protect our economy, our people. That's the reason why he said all of these things. So this graph over here, like I said, hides a lot of things that we don't uh, uh, see in a mile high view. I put that over here, sunset on India. So farmers, artisans, we talked about that, British taxation collapse, industrial revolution underwritten by Indian money and knowledge, artisan classes impoverished by British manufactured goods. And the next thing was, at that time, Macaulay came to the scene. Macaulay came to the scene and said, let's now distance the Indians from their systems, from their traditional systems, and introduce the English education system. At that time, who was there to man the schools? The out-of-a-job Brahmin. Out of job Brahmin in order to eat and survive, he became the school principal, school teacher, college. If you see why they're disproportionately Brahmins over here, the British favored them because they knew they were the respected people in society. If they teach English, maybe the others will come and learn. With that purpose, they favored the Brahmins over here. And missionaries like Caldwell came, turned around, told the Dravidian, you see the Brahmin, he's a reason for your poverty. <laughs> <laughs> Having created poverty, they turned around and told the confused classes that the Brahmin is controlling access to education, to jobs, clerical systems, and he's the one who has been uh, keeping you down. So the circle is complete. The bigotry, the greed, the avarice, and everything, the circle is complete. This is what the British did in India. All that is hiding in everything that I wrote over here. British education system collapsed, traditional learning, disconnected people from roots. Missionaries further the divide, taking advantage of large poverty turmoil in the country. You cannot go from here to here without severe psychological stresses. You cannot. Anybody who goes from that point to this point has got enormous distress that is going to show up in the society in one way or the other. Society can become insular. You can say us and them may start happening. You may want to have your distance from somebody else. Maybe all the perversions of the so-called caste system that we are seeing could have arisen because of this kind of a distress in the society. So, like I said, this is hiding many, many things over here. Yes. What was going wrong with China during that period? So China was also going through British uh, things, the so-called opium wars and other such things. The British are attempting to control the Chinese, control the trade over there. There's a reason why Hong Kong and Shanghai were the British outposts. So they were trying to control trade over there. And and interestingly, opium was also being grown in India. Yes, <laughs> uh, from, from uh, West Bengal, those areas. Yes, yes. And very good that, uh, to control that. And that is very important data point. That's a very important data point because the British, in textbooks we are told, they introduced land reforms. 
what they did was they went to the zamindar and said that 90% of the producers are ours 10% is yours so the landlord to maximize the 10% encouraged cash crops opm indigo and other such things and there was no food grains that's why the famines in bengal and other such places because of british policies and i didn't tell the last part of the story when tanjavur became impoverished like that the only option for those people was to walk all the way to chennai because they couldn't afford bullock carts and things like that and go and sit on the docks in chennai like that waiting to be picked up as an indentured laborer in trinidad tobago mauritius fiji malaysia and all these places they are waiting to be picked as indentured laborers if today you are wondering how come in these west indies and other places there are two populations the tamilian and the bihari why because these are the two places the british did this <laughs> these are the two places the british did this these are the poor descendants of those people and there the reason why they're there is the power Im impoverishment they caused in the mechanisms that i told you about that is the reason all right so let's uh, move on we talked about will durant last time so I'm not going to say the same thing but he also observed that indians are taxed at two to three times the scotland rate he also observes this in his book case for india he also talks about the national debt about in 1860 how it was half a billion by 1929 when wealthy rand left india how it had risen to excuse me 3.5 billion and so enormous uh, 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 poverty that they had caused this is a, a researcher who who talked about this in november 21st 2018 just one week back or so in live mint uh, this is a dr utsa patnaik so she says the british siphon 45 trillion dollars from india in contrast with what will durant's estimate was 3.5 billion in 1930 she says the overall from 1765 to 1938 is 45 trillion couple of quotes from utsa patnaik she says there's virtually no increase in per capita income between 1900 to 1946 no growth at all absolutely no growth and she says per capita annual consumption of food grains went down from 200 kgs in 1900 to 157 the eve of world war 2 and further plummeted down to 137 kg by 1946 this statement poignant statement is hiding a lot of reality all the famines are hiding here all the malnutrition is hiding here infant mortality is hiding here every dismal indicator of british colonial india health indicator is hiding here this is all because of what the british did so it is a very very sad thing uh, what happened over here i'm willing to bet that almost everybody in this audience if you go back to your grandfather's time or your great grandfather's time i'm willing to bet they were dirt poor i'm willing to bet they didn't even have proper clothes to wear or good food to eat i'm willing to bet that because that was a story all over india very few maharaja classes the so most of us were in this uh, muck that the british left us in so so the uh, first thing to talk about is precession precession is a phenomenon that the earth is doing under the gravitational action of the sun moon jupiter and possibly venus under that gravitational action the earth while it is rotating in this is pointing to about 23.22 uh, and odd degrees in the sky in the northern hemisphere rotating once in 24 hours west to east going around the sun once in 365.24 days but under the effect of precession it is also doing a slow circle in the sky that takes around 26000 years a very very slow precession cycle so today we are pointing at polaris as adruva when yagnavalkya when he wrote shatapatha brahmana in 3000 bc thuban was druva at that time for him and uh, there was a time when uh, abhijit was the pole star vega once again 12000 years from now abhijit will be the pole star because of precession then the indian astronomical model so the indian astronomical model was one of nakshatras and rashi every day the indians observe that ancient indians the moon would appear in the eastern horizon at a different time and therefore in a different backdrop of the stars every day different time they also notice that it is taking approximately 27 days to go back to the same phase so they divided the entire ecliptic into 27 segments and each segment is 13 and 1/3 degrees and these were the nakshatras for them 
So it's not enough to divide it, you must also recognize it. So in order to recognize, I said, what is the principal brightest star in each segment of the sky? And that will give the name for the nakshatra. Ancient Indians were adept at pedagogy. They knew that if they give dry facts, it's very tough to remember. That's why the most of the Vedic uh, verses and everything are very short process, very, very short process to remember. So the ancient Indians brought the story of King Daksha. King Daksha had 27 beautiful daughters and he married them all to Chandra. And every day Chandra would visit one of his wives and that became the lunar mansions. And the nakshatras encode the name of each of uh, uh, the moon's wives. And there's a story behind each of those things. Those stories are encoding astronomical wisdom. And through that we know what, what uh, different things are. So these are the different nakshatras that you see. Ancient Indians also observed the concept of a month. If the full moon appeared in Chitra nakshatra, that month was called the Chaitra month. One minute. Yes, sir. Rohini was very close to Chandra. There is a concept. Does it fit into this? Yes, it does. It does. It does. I have it in a different presentation and uh, I need to stop this presentation and go there. But I'll tell you that because my thinking was to tell you about that. So I'll, I'll come to that. Just remind me if I fail, I'll come to that story. So Chaitra month, if it is in, in full moon is uh, Mrigashira, that is a Margashira month. So this way ancient Indians had the concept of the nakshatra for the day and the lunar month. They had both of them. So these are a listing of the nakshatras in two of our ancient books, Vedanga Jyotisha, Surya Siddhanta, and the principal star associated with each of these nakshatras. How this mapping happened? When the British came to India, they asked the Pandit, what is that nakshatra? When the Pandit said the name, they said, we call it this name. That, that way, colonialists were able to do the mapping between uh, the nakshatras and the, and the Western uh, identification. So we talked about this last time. If somebody says Rama was born in Chaitra Masa, it means the full moon was in Chitra Nakshatra because that month is Chaitra month and 180 degrees away is the sun in Ashwini Nakshatra because the sun is 180 degrees away, the moon is over here. So we know that sun is in Ashwini when the moon was in, uh, in, in Chitra Nakshatra. So just by saying Rama was born in Chaitra Masa, two pieces of data jump out at me. If somebody says Varsha Ritu began in Ashada Masa, rainy season, it means full moon is in Ashada Nakshatra, sun is in Punarvash Nakshatra, 180 degrees away. But today's India, rain is when the sun is in the Orion, Orion is Mrigha Nakshatra. So there is a two Nakshatra difference and that has happened because of the same precision. We can compute the precision rate, 26,000 divided by 27 gives you how many years per Nakshatra is it going to recess and that is about 960 years. So 960 times 2 gives approximately 2000 years ago the statement was true and that's from Kalidasa's Megaduta. So this is how astronomers are able to take a measurement and then decode it with our today's understanding of precision and other things and do this. So this shows several things I like to point out. This one at the center here is Dhruva, is a polar star. And whenever Indians talked about nakshatra, it is always when the moon appears in the eastern horizon, what section of the sky is it in? So last night, 28th at 11.30 at night, the moon was in Maga. This is the Maga nakshatra over here. So therefore, from yesterday, 11.30 onwards, it is the Maga nakshatra. So today it might slip to the next one, which is, I think this is uh, Pur Purva Falguni. So today's nakshatra might eventually go into Puro Falguni. Probably we still are under Maga. You may want to check in your Google and see what's today's nakshatra. That's the reason why. I'd like to point out several other things. Saptarishi that is over here. Saptarishi goes around Dhruva. That's a, pu a Puranic story, right? And you can see that happening here. I'd like to point out Abhijit. These circles over here are projection of the Earth's latitudes and longitudes on the sky. So they become celestial coordinates. This is celestial north pole, 90 degrees, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, and zero. Zero is the celestial equator. On the day of the equinox, the sun is exactly in the celestial equator. Then for six months, the sun would appear to go north and north towards the north pole for six months, up to 23.2 degrees. Then it'll retract south and south and south and go up to minus 23.2 degrees. This is the Uttrayana and the Dakshinayana. 
So ancient Indians knew about the solstice points, the extremal, and they could measure how long the sun takes to go from one point to the other, and they got it exactly at 365.24 odd uh, days. This is how they measured the solar year in addition. So they got the solar year, they knew the nakshatra, they knew the lunar month and the lunar year, and they were able to add the concept of adhikamasa, because to get the synchrony between the lunar and the solar calendar, they knew every four years, five years or so, they must add an Adhika Masa that will bring things to synchrony. So our ancestors were experts at understanding the night sky, understanding the movements of heavenly bodies and making sense into a calendar, trying to make sense of lunar, solar calendar, making sense of all of these things. Plus, in addition, they had equations, mathematics to do all of these things. Today, when somebody says all of these things are in Jyotish Shastra, Pavlovian response, people say, oh, it's horoscope, I don't believe in all these things. So it's a very pathetic indication of where we have landed up today. However, for the ancient Indians, this was very precise Siddhantic mathematics. Lots of mathematics that talked about the equation of motion of Venus, equation of motion of Venus, of the Moon, equation of motion of Mars. They knew all these things. They were able to estimate constants of that. They were able to estimate uh, when a transit would happen, when an occultation would happen, when would an eclipse happen, what will be the duration of the eclipse. All these things they were able to compute because they did not only planar trigonometry. Planar trigonometry means on a plane. They did circular trigonometry spherical trigonometry they were able to do that so this is the kind of things our ancestors have done and uh, all is hiding in this little thing so when uh, an indian ancient indian would come out to the night sky just look at the sky he'll be able to tell you exactly which nakshatra what is going on and all those kind of things today we have lost stability so we can't do this kali yuga talked about this earlier rare planet conjunction of saturn jupiter mars venus mercury sun moon and revati nakshatra the reason why we need to understand Kali Yuga is Aryabhata gives us rage with respect to Kali Yuga and temples in Karnataka and Badami in epigraphy they talk about the age with respect to Kali Yuga. If you don't know what this means you can't date any of these things. The British came to India and they decoded this as 18 February 3102 BCE and it instantly caused them heartburn. It caused them heartburn if you remember the first thing that I said about Noah's flood 3000 BCE in their worldview, they could not admit that you have a chronological data point that goes beyond Noah's flood. This was the data point that caused all the problems in the British uh, uh, mucking around our uh, uh, chronology. It started over here. So, the, so the, this was found by them at uh, 18 February 3102 BCE. Simulated this in the calendar in my planetarium software. And what you see is, this is the ground line over here. And you see that Revati Nakshatra is here, Mangala is here, Sun is here, Chandra is here, Shukran is Venus is here, Guru Jupiter is here, Buddha and Mercury is here, Shani is sitting out there. It's spread over a couple of nakshatras, but the least squares fit appears to be in Revati. This did not happen for more than 26,000 years. There was a clustering 6,600 BC, but that was in a different nakshatra. It is not in Revati. In Revati, at least for 26,000 years, this did not happen. So with great precision, we can say that Kali Yuga perhaps is uh, this one, as described in Aryabhatiya or Surya Siddhanta. In that tradition, this is the start. Mahabharata Vanaparva has a dialogue, Indra and Skanda contesting against Abhijits. Nakshatra, Kritika, Pleiades went to Vana, summer solstice heat the summer, Abhijit slipped down the sky. British jumped upon this to discredit it and said that here is an example of ridiculousness in Indian texts that you can't trust them, they're unreliable. They're talking about unphysical things. Then P. V. Vartak said that it is encoding an astronomical phenomenon. He said it is encoding a time when Abhijit was a pole star. It was a pole star approximately 14,000 years ago. And by the time the Mahabharata war was written down, it no longer was a pole star. It appeared to have fallen in the sky. So it appears that there was cultural memory of Abhijit being the pole star passed down generation by generation until such time Mahabharata was written down and it appeared that it was no longer the pole star. That appears to be encoded. Then Kritika at the summer solstice happened 24,000 years ago. A very staggering amount of time that is encoded in some of our measurements. The implication is Rishis have probably been observing the skies for more than 24,000 years. That is what this is telling us. 14,000 years ago, simulated this, and you can see Abhijit is over here. 
at the pole star point. In the earlier graph, it was somewhere over here where it appeared to have fallen in the sky. But 14,000 years ago, it's a pole star. Shatapatha Brahmana, it has a statement that Kritika never swerves from the east. Again, an intriguing data point written by Rishi Yajnavalkya. You know, today he was writing a manual for the Vedic practitioner. If your guest is coming from that door, your door is over there, I can't do namaste over here. It is very, very disrespectful. The guest is coming there, I need to do namaste over there. All the Vedic homas were done for Agni or Surya. And so they needed to point to where is he going to rise in the sky. I need to put my uh, Vedic Homa pit over here, the bricks I need to arrange. And so I face Agni as soon as he comes and start my fire and start the ritual. That was the idea. So Yajna Valkya wanted to tell the practitioner, where is the east direction? If I ask somebody here, where is the east direction? They'll say, oh, where is the sunrise? That's east direction. Unfortunately, because of Uttarayana and Dakshinayana, the sun seems to retract more and more to the north, then more and more to the south. So where is the east direction? It's not here, 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 here and here. It's not. The sun is pointing to east only on the day of equinox. On the day of equinox, it is exactly the true east direction. So there was a period of time when Yajna Valkya wrote Shatapatha Brahmana and in his time, Kritika was pointing to that because it was on the celestial equator. This is the celestial equator, Kritika is over here. Therefore, he wrote, Kritika never swerves from the east. You can light your fire under Kritika. That's what he wrote. And that refers to this, knowing this. So this is the ground line. Vedic practitioner would have got up, went to still dark, done a ritual bath, come outside and looked at where is Kritika, still dark in the sky. Ah, Kritika is over there. Then maybe about half an hour or one hour later, sun rises and Kritika is out in the sky. But sun is there, Kritika is there, straight line. You start putting your pet. That is the idea. So this is true for plus minus 100 years around this time frame. Approximately still true. So an amazing data point that shows a Vedic concept in place much before the so-called Aryan invasion. Taitriya Samhita 6.5.3 talks about Kritika, the winter solstice that works out to 8921 BCE. One more of those ancient data points sitting over there. Conclusion from here is that uh, dates preserved in Brahmanas and Upanishads show very great antiquity. Kali Yuga date shows a Vedic concept in place before the alleged Aryan migration. And this evidence of great antiquity of Indians backed by archaeological finds too. Today, we have in Birana urban finds up to 9,000 years ago. So the dates that we are finding in archaeology also supports this. It was not true some time back, but today it is more and more true. Now let me go back to the question you asked. You asked a story from the Puranas. You said that um, the Puranic story says, after Daksha had married his daughters to the Chandra, he heard that Chandra favors Rohini more than the other wives. And he was furious with his son-in-law. How can he favor one of his daughters and not treat them all equally? So he curses Chandra and says that you will fade and die. And Chandra runs off to Mahadeva and he prays to Mahadeva, please protect me. And Mahadeva grants him a boon and says that you will not die. You will fade and fade and fade and become dark and again you will grow. That's why even today in Mahadeva you find the symbol of uh, the sun, oh, sorry, the moon. That's remembering that story. So what is the story all about? That is the question. Well, I did some studies on that and I had a TED talk on this. If you search for my name on a TED talk, you will find where I've discussed this in relation to decoding the stories in some of our Puranas. So it turns out that when the sun is going, sorry, the moon is going on the ecliptic, it sometimes comes close to a principal star and sometimes it fully covers the principal star. Okay, sometimes it goes over, sometimes it covers it. When it covers it from our view, if, if this is the star and this is the moon, from your perspective, the moon has covered the star. That is the idea. This is called a lunar occultation. So I did a study of how often does a lunar occultation happen with all the principal stars of the nakshatras. It turns out that the principal stars are divided in the ecliptic. Ecliptic is a line on which the sun, moon appear to go. So from the ecliptic, how many degrees away are the principal stars? That is the question. If the nakshatra star is greater than six degrees from the ecliptic, it will never be occulted. If it is between four degrees and six degrees, 
it will experience a cluster of, I think, um, I've forgotten the exact numbers. It experiences a cluster of occult occultations. Let me just say that. One huge cluster of occultations in a four-year period. Over four years, you'll find that it's clustered that. If it is less than four degrees, then it will have two sets of occultations separated by a period of time. That is what it is. Then I try to find how often are the various nakshatras occulted by moon. Turns out that in this four-year period ending in this year, 2018, 2014 to 2018, Rohini, which is Aldebaran, was occulted 56 times. 56 times by the sun, sorry, the moon. And the next nearest one was Kritika. Kritika, the occultations ended in 2009 or 2008, that time frame, and there were 24 occultations. 24 occultations with Kritika and about 56 with Rohini and it will repeat all over after 19 years. After 19 years, once again, you'll get a cluster of four years where it will occult it and 19 years of silence. So ancient Indians had observed that there was such a phenomenon happening over 19 year period, more, many 19 year periods, comparing how often does a moon visit his wives and finally figure out that he likes Rohini more than the others. <laughs> So that astronomical wisdom is encoded in a Puranic story, a romantic uh, Puranic story, which we remember today. It is so easy to remember that uh, Chandra loved Rohini, but we have lost the key to unlocking that wisdom. So my research in the TED talk showed that it is basically this phenomenon that is encoded over here, the occultation phenomenon. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, coming to how old is the Indian civilization? This has not changed much from last year. Genetics shows the ancient people living continuously 85,000 years ago. Archaeology now shows artifacts from 1 million years ago. And astronomical observation shows artifacts from 24,000 years ago. So very, very ancient uh, 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 knowledge, or rather evidence of antiquity in India. I'd like to conclude with uh, Indian knowledge systems. I'd like to show there's no conflict of knowledge with the philosophy of the land. This is the theme in what I'm going to talk about over here and I'll explain that in a few slides. Last year also we talked about knowledge systems, Shruti, that which is heard, Vedas, Samhitas, Brahmanas, Aranyakas, Upanishads, for example, mantras, hymns, prayers, commentaries on hymns and rituals, rituals, philosophy. These are all the contents of these ancient texts. And the Smriti, that which is remembered, Vedangas, all grammar, meter, astronomy, rituals, itihasas, these texts, Puranas, Kavyas. Sutras, Shastras, various schools of philosophy, Nibandhas, lots of things were present in India such that anybody could find intellectual expression within the frameworks that existed in the country with absolutely no conflict with the philosophy. We live in a strange world today where science is in conflict with the dominant religious systems of the world. The Abrahamic systems cannot accommodate science because of their history centricism. So over here, Darwin came about saying theory of evolution and instantly the fundamentalists went on a war path saying that no, how, can, how is it possible? We didn't descend from that. God created man in his image, which means we look like God and perfectly. We cannot have descended from apes. So it caused great ruckus and outrage with them. And even till today in United States, there are states, for example, Louisiana, where they used to stamp on the science textbooks that theory of evolution is only a theory. I'm not joking, even during Jindal's time, even during the so-called enlightened Jindal's time, they're stamping on that in the history, high school history textbooks to tell the children, beware, what you're learning is not true. So such things are there, but in India, we never had a conflict of science and technology. And this is, sorry, science and philosophy. And there's a reason for that. If you look at this one, one-line descriptions of the Indian schools, we talked about this last year too. Nyaya said all knowledge is not intrinsically valid. Most knowledge is not valid unless proven. Truth exists whether we humans know it or not. Nakshapada Gautama was a Rishi who did, said that. Vaisheshika perception inference, Rishi Kannada. Samkhya systematic enumeration, rational examination, Kapila. Puro Mimamsa talked on reflection, consideration, profound thought, investigation, examination, discussion. Rishi Jaimini talked about that. Uttara Mimamsa or Vedanta up to 10 schools and Adi Shankara, one of the exponents of Advaita. And you can see that the Indic thoughts admitted a lot of mechanisms for knowledge. These are profound statements over here. 
very profound statements that admit the, uh, uh, the, the process of knowledge gathering. If you look at this slide, the means of knowledge or pramana, in the Indian context, you can look at perception, inference, comparison, analogy, postulation, derivation from circumstances, negative proof or shabda pramana relying on word of experts. And you will see that every sampradaya in India only differed on under what authority are you admitting knowledge. That was the basis. For example, the Charvakas, the traditional atheist in Indian context, they only admitted perception. If I can see it, it's true. Otherwise, it's not. I reject the Vedas and other such things. And the Buddhists, they said only perception and inference, nothing else is valid as a mechanism for knowledge. This is what Buddha did, right? He went through a process of trials and tribulations and realized some truths. That's what he said. Vaisheshika similarly starts admitting several other things over here. Dvaita, Jainism and Advaita takes from every uh, school that you can see over here. So what is the bottom line? Today we live in a world where if you're doing your PhD thesis, for example, maybe electrical engineering, you're going to say that I refer to this IEEE journal on the authority of this man who published in this journal, I am going to write my PhD thesis. I wrote this and reference number one, number two in the literature survey. This is what you do. You're relying on Shabda Pramana of some professor over there. Or maybe you're going to say this Nobel Prize winner said this. On the basis of that, I'm going to do my work. I'm referencing this man. On his authority, I'm writing my work. So this is the way we claim knowledge systems today on the authority of somebody else who did something else. In ancient India, you can see it was a much more broader context in understanding the sources of knowledge, what is a valid means for knowledge and so on. Today you have a bigoted narrative in the Marxist textbook that have pulled the Buddhists, the Jains and others out of the Indic Dharmic context. However, the only difference of Sampradaya is what is it that you are admitting as knowledge? That is the only difference. Everybody in the Dharmic tradition believed in Dharma, they believed in Karma, they believed in reincarnation. This bedrock was there for all of them. The only things that differed was what is knowledge and how am I going to admit it? That was the only difference. And this picture over here summarizes a lot of Indic uh, philosophies and knowledge. So it's good to know what is the goal of life. If you ask a Hindu what is the goal of life, the Hindu's goal of life is to dispel avidya from our minds about the true nature of who I am. And this dispelling avidya might happen in one lifetime or across multiple lifetimes depending on my karma. This is our understanding. So the Indic formula has been to dispel avidya and to gain vidya and these are all the mechanisms for gaining knowledge. To gain knowledge of your true self, to understand there's no separation between creator and created, to understand that we are part of the cosmos, to understand that it's only ego and our attachment to the world of objects that prevents me from understanding that the same Narayana is in both of us. These kind of ideas of Vedanta are all encoded when the Hindu is urged, one line statement, who is a Hindu, what is your goal, life, to dispel avidya about my true existence, that Satchitananda is a state that I need to go into. That is the idea of a, a Hindu. In the Abrahamic tradition, the goal of life is to follow a divine dictated law. So God gave the Ten Commandments to uh, one of the prophets and the goal in life is to follow those Ten Commandments. Or Christ said certain things that his followers, the, the apostles, the gospels, they wrote down what he said. And if you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and he's the uh, only way to the Father is through the Son, then you're saved. Either you go to uh, heaven or eternal damnation, depending on the following of the law. Similarly, the Muslims also, if you believe that uh, Muhammad, the prophet, he heard from Archangel Gabriel, who dictated the word of God to him. And if you follow the Quran's injunctions, then maybe the mercy of Allah, you'll be saved or you'll have eternal damnation. So the goal in life for Abrahamic people is follow divine dictated law. None of this is relevant. None of this is relevant because knowledge or any such thing is irrelevant. Your only goal, admission to heaven or eternal damnation. Those are the only two things. And the only formula is you follow a divine dictated law. Whereas in the Hindu ideas, it was you dispel avidya about your existence and that will happen based on your karma phala 
based in this lifetime or across multiple lifetimes depending on the kind of life you live and at every lifetime you are enjoined upon depending on which sampradaya you are born into to admit certain knowledge based on these things okay so this is all i wanted to say about knowledge systems about how every knowledge in india whether it was mathematics astronomy philosophy whether it was grammar prosody music medicine you name it everything coexisted with the philosophy of the land everything was embedded in the philosophy of the land everything gave citation to brahma this knowledge came from brahma brahma thought it was ashwini ashwini thought it to maybe uh, punarvashvatraya or to bharadwaj bharadwaj gave it to somebody and so on so every knowledge in the indic context goes back and says brahma gave this knowledge this is it i don't want to go there now <laughs> sir what but we'll come back to that we'll come back to that so you you're right what what is brahma over here the the concept is important brahma is seen as a symbol symbol for the creator he is a person who calls upon creation shrimad bhagavatam talks about that he calls upon the creation depending on uh, pralaya and so on so he's the one who's supposed to do that we'll talk about in the q and a maybe a little later so uh, last time i talked about evidence of knowledge outflow of india so this time i just put it into high level headings we already talked about many of these things don't want to repeat it but uh, when people say if you claim that knowledge went out of india which is contrary to what people like david pingree and others are saying that babylonian thought indians the greek thoughts indians and knowledge came into india we were very good students but we never were teachers according to the narrative of the west but however i am claiming something else the vedic records of migration for example that srikant thalagiri if you read that 3000 bc or so it appears that knowledge from india might have gone out to the west we talked about saraswati indus climate changed uh, induced migration 2000 bce getting out of india if you listen to my talk on antiquity of indian medical systems on youtube i have talked about how ayurvedic knowledge the echoes of ayurvedic knowledge is there in the hittites and mitannis elamites egyptians and so on so in this time frame a lot of contact with indians was there the mycenians are the greek people and every greek story has got a parallel with an indian story in the puranic story how is that possible so this is the pre homeric period so around 1000 bce so i'm claiming there's contact from that time itself with india which is why there's uh, uh, these things evidence for these assertions internal evidence of vedas we talked to anun drihyu correlation with climate change records appearance of sanskritic people in middle east echoes of indic thought in those cultures strong parallels in stories of astronomy and so on and travel by greek scholars to india we know about pythagoras we know about democritus we know about pyron we know about all these people because in greece there was a tradition your knowledge is not complete till you go to india ethiopia egypt get knowledge and come back so there there was a tradition in those countries to travel to these places and come back 3000 bc to 300 bc all of these are the routes then after alexander uh, he left behind several kingdoms over here facilitated knowledge exchange from uh, mediterranean lands from india to mediterranean lands silk route was a third uh, a mechanism all over southeast uh, asia to china from india all the way to mediterranean lands we had tra trading routes and this was also the period of buddhist time where the buddhists were taking knowledge for example hu and sang fahian all these people came on the silk route they came to india through takshashila on the silk route into india i'd like to give the example of the bower manuscript bower manuscript is the oldest extant manual a manuscript of indian medicine that is present in the country today it's written on birch bark document and it's written in gupta brahmi script because in gupta brahmi script we can talk about the age of some of these things and it seems to have uh, several things it talks about the rishis atreya it talks about uh, parashara and other rishis and it has got bela samhita it has got uh, portions of charaka samhita it has got the doshas it talks about vata pitta kapha it also talks about rakta dosha in some places so this document was found in kashkar somewhere over here kashkar sinjian province and it was given to a british officer called bower that's why it's called bower manuscript and the fact that indian knowledge was on a trade route is proof that even indian knowledge was carried along with the trade people to rest of the world that is the evidence we talked about periplus of erythrean sea there is a port sailors document the roman sailors would come from mediterranean lands cross a land bridge over here 
go wherever there is water navigable. They trade in all these ports in the west coast of India and some on the east coast of India. During this time also we know about uh, knowledge exchange. Muslim transmissions, I talked about that last time, won't go into great detail, but all the way from Sindh up to Spain, through these lands, Arabia, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, up to Spain, there was transmission of Indic knowledge. Translations of Sanskrit works were made into Arabic ever since uh, Bin Qasim uh, came to that part of India in 711. The works like Charaka Samhita, works like Brahmasputta Siddhanta, so many other works are translated and given, uh, rather taken away and injected up to Spain. Then we know that European church travelers from 10th century to 19th century, they took knowledge directly from India into Europe. Then this knowledge I'm showing during Greek and Roman time, Indic knowledge seeded their cultures. However, when the Roman Empire became Christian, they destroyed all that. Constantine, 300 current era, adopted Christianity as a state religion. And his successor, Theodosius, he went on a rampage basically, allowed the destruction of all the so-called pagan institutions. That was the time the neo-converts started burning down the libraries, the temples and other such things in Greece and other places. All the Indic knowledge which they had stored there was destroyed when, uh, when the Christians went on a rampage uh, during this time frame. However, some of that knowledge has survived in, uh, uh, in Roman lands, not loosely connected with them, like Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and these places. It survived. And this knowledge was inherited by the Muslims, who also took knowledge destructively from India. So people like Al-Baruni, they had got the Greek works, and they had studied that. And then they came to India, studied Sanskrit, and he was able to study Sanskrit works. So they're able to do side-by-side -side comparison. One of the first uh, scientists. Today we are lucky, we live in the era of Google where we can take documents from anywhere in the world, do a comparative study. But in ancient times, you have to go to that place and copy that document. Otherwise, your knowledge system was rooted over here. So that uh, multi-regional knowledge systems, I think the Muslims were very lucky. So that's why you have people like Al-Fazali, Al-Ghazali, uh, and so many other uh, scientists who took Indic knowledge and made greater advances in that time frame. You can look up a place called Baghdad House of Wisdom. If you Google for it, you'll find how uh, Harun al-Rashid, he was a caliph, he instituted that in Baghdad, and that promoted science and technology in those lands. In contrast, the same period of time and later, the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughal period, they never invested in science and technology in India. They were completely given to uh, vices and other such things using the money, but not an economic productivity and saving science and such things. So whereas the Muslims in Baghdad were scientifically oriented, the Muslims in India were uh, fundamentally oriented. So there's a different uh, things that happened in India. So this knowledge by the Muslims was injected into Spain, where during that period of time, there was a translation school in Toledo, whose only job in Christian Toledo was to translate Arabic texts into Latin. So we know of Gerard of Cremona, who has translated 87 Arabic texts into Latin. And some of them included Indian texts that have translated into Arabic and now translated into Latin. That is how Western Europe, which was under the clutches of the church, backwardness, poverty, illiteracy, and disease. That was the state of Western Europe ever since they became Christian, the Dark Ages, from 300 current era all the way to 1400s or so. This was the state of that nation. And at that time in Western Europe, they'd send the eldest born son to India, sorry, to, uh, to, uh, to Muslim Spain to learn. They would go to Spain and learn at the feet of the Muslims to learn because Muslim knowledge is superior to their own knowledge systems. So this is a time when Western Europe was ramping up on the Indian knowledge. You should also remember this was a time when Western Europe was using the Roman numerals. We have evidence that Hindu numerals and positional arithmetic and zero did not become widespread in Europe until the late 1500s. It's only after 1500s it became popular. Earlier than that, they were using uh, Latin Roman numerals. And how much can you do with Roman numerals? You just imagine adding or multiplying huge numbers. You can't do that. So that's why their sciences, technology was backward. You may like to read a book called uh, Universal History of Numbers by George Irfa. So he calls out a lot of these kinds of things. 
Then uh, at a time when Western Europe was finally able to uh, take over even the Muslim lands, basically um, Ferdinand and Isabella. So they were the ones of the Pope's blessings and other Christian armies. They were able to go and conquer Muslim Spain. They were able to take uh, 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 Spain back for Christianity. They went through a period of inquisition. Inquisition was seen to cleanse their society of Muslim influence, Jewish influence and these things. And anybody found in possession of Muslim knowledge was seen as taking knowledge from Satan. And he was immediately either killed or forced to recant and all those kinds of things there. So this resulted in all the so-called Renaissance scholars hiding their sources. They wouldn't say that they got their knowledge from Indian texts or Greek texts because they were all seen as coming from Muslims. So there's huge problem in society at that time. But at any rate, Renaissance is supposed to have happened, a flowering of so-called uh, European thought, unquestioningly obeyed and listened to by us today without criticizing. And the colonialists, 16th century, 20th century, Portuguese, Dutch, French, British, they also came to India, took a lot of knowledge and all that has come back to us today, repackaged and without citations. And our people start thinking that, oh my goodness, these are people who have gone all the way to Jupiter, look at their computers, look at their mathematics, where are we, we are a superstitious lord, backward, primitive, but we don't realize where did it come from? Where did this come from? Where did the philosophy come from? Where did the knowledge systems come from? Where did the medicine come from? Where did the numbers come from? Not one of us are equipped to question these because our own education system has made us ignorant. That is a tragedy because we don't know what our ancestors did. We don't know that uh, we are the inheritors of this knowledge, unfortunate. So here's a paper that I wrote in uh, Waves 2018. You can download this, the free PDF. This talks about uh, selected contributions of India to knowledge systems. I've given several particular references, more than 50 to 60 references are there. So you can see uh, uh, particular knowledge systems that I've uh, uh, taken. We talked about this Spanish Inquisition, knowledge from Satan, savage retribution, Renaissance scholars hid their sources, passed off uh, their uh, Greek and Indi Indian works as their own original works. <laughs> However, because their works on astronomy, math, medicine are all predated by Indian and Greek works and they ignore citation, I call them plagiarizing. So this conclusion is not changed from last year. It's the same conclusion. This still call them plagiarizing. So here's the grand conclusion of this talk. So we started on the premise that we are revisiting last year's talk and revisiting with the evidence that we have. And so we went through a lot of new evidence that has come since last year. And we are still in a position to say the mainstream narrative is utterly bygotten and it's wrong. There is no Aryan invasion theory. Evidence shows an out of India theory. Evidence shows Indic thought impacted East and West. Evidence shows that we are a very ancient civilization. Indic thought seeded the Greeks and the Babylonians rather than borrowing from them. Finally, we did a deep dive into poverty and we can know fully well that invasions are responsible for widespread poverty in India. So thank you for your support. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.